Good afternoon to everyone um, who's in the east or central zones and good morning to the folks who are with us from mountain and Pacific land. Thank you for joining us and welcome to a We Are Called film screening and discussion on al racial algorithms in healthcare. We're offering this event in April as part of National Minority Health Month. This is our third watch party, which is what we're calling them. The previous two looked at how racism affects health in general. And specifically, uh, the second one looked at its impact on black women and their pregnancies. Uh, my name is Kathy Curran. I'm the Senior Director for Public Policy here at the Catholic Health Association. You may have been expecting Paolo Pantamayor. I am not he, uh, but Paolo is the driving force behind these watch parties. Congress got off to a really slow start this year and they decided to get real busy this week. So Paolo um, had to be on the Hill and I am pinching in for him. Really pleased to be here with you today. Uh, before we get started, uh, let us um, begin as we always do um, when we gather together with a reflection. And let's um, remember that we are in the presence of a loving God as we settle down and um, take a minute. God of all people, you came as one of us to show how we belong to each other. You served among us to show how we are to serve one another. You called us to follow you, that we might build a better world together. God of wisdom and compassion, renew our minds with your call to humble learning and service. Refresh our hearts with your call to equity and integrity of community. Reignite our spirits with your call to justice for our brothers and sisters. God of righteousness and justice, Make us relentless as we examine the structures that perpetuate inequity. Make us humble as we lean in to listen and learn what we do not know. Make of us steady allies and advocates, leveraging the strength of our shared ministry for the good of your people. And we ask this in your name, amen. Um, today's video, which was produced by Vox Media, will raise important questions about race and the use of algorithms in many settings, including healthcare, and I hope it will give rise to a robust conversation afterwards. Our co-host and commentator today during that discussion is LaRonda Chastang. LaRonda is the Senior Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Trinity Health, where she's responsible for the development and implementation of Trinity's national DEI strategy covering over 110,000 colleagues, 26,000 physicians and clinicians across 26 states. Her leadership and expertise is constantly being recognized. For example, she was noted uh, by Modern Healthcare on their 2022 Top Diversity Leaders in Healthcare list. She's also a leader within the Catholic Health Ministry. She's a member of CHA's Board Committee on Diversity and Health Disparities, and a member of the Advisory Council for the We Are Called Initiative. So, LaRonda, thank you so much for being here with us today. Kathy, it is always my pleasure. And so thank you so much for inviting me. I'm looking forward to a robust conversation. Great. After we watch the video, um, LaRonda and I will talk a little bit about um, what we've seen and, and we'll get her reaction and she can share a little bit about what's going on at Trinity Health as well. While you're watching the film, please think about how your facility or system is using algorithms, whether you're aware of efforts to detect racially driven outcomes, um, and also your thoughts generally about how algorithms affect various aspects of our lives and works, because we're gonna wanna hear from you after the video. Um, we have this set up to really be an opportunity for conversation. Uh, so with no further ado, uh, I think we are going to begin the video. It runs about 20 minutes and then we'll be back for conversation. So we will see you shortly. Maybe we, if you guys could stand over here. Is it okay if they stand over here? Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, Christoph, you can get even lower. Okay. This is Lee and this is Christoph. They're two of the hosts of this show. But to a machine, they're not people. This is just pixels, it's just data. A machine shouldn't have a reason to prefer one of these guys over the other. And yet, as you'll see in a second, it does. It feels weird to call. Oh, a machine racist, but I really can't explain. 
can't explain what just happened. Data-driven systems are becoming a bigger and bigger part of our lives, and they work well a lot of the time. But when they fail... Once again, it's the white guy. When they fail, they're not failing on everyone equally. If I go back right now... You can have neutral intentions, you can have good intentions, and the outcomes can still be discriminatory. Whether you want to call that machine racist or you want to call the outcome racist, we have a problem. I was scrolling through my Twitter feed a while back and I kept seeing tweets that looked like this. Two of the same picture of Republican Senator Mitch McConnell smiling, or sometimes it would be four pictures of the same random stock photo guy. And I didn't really know what was going on, but it turns out that this was a big public test of algorithmic bias because it turns out that these aren't pictures of just Mitch McConnell. They're pictures of Mitch McConnell and Barack Obama. Oh, wow. So people were uploading these really extreme vertical images to basically force this image cropping algorithm to choose one of these faces. People were alleging that there's a racial bias here. But I think what's so interesting about this particular algorithm is that it is so testable for the public. It's something that we could test right now if we wanted to. Do it. You guys want to yeah, do it? it? Okay. Here we go. So Twitter does offer you options to crop your own image, but if you don't use those, it uses an automatic cropping algorithm. Wow. Whoa. There it is. Wow. That's crazy. Kristoff, it likes you. Okay, let's try the other, the happy wow. one. <laughs> Unbelievable. It's both times. What is this? Oh, wow. So, do you guys think this machine is racist? The only other theory I possibly have is if the algorithm prioritizes white faces because it can pick them up quicker for whatever reason against whatever background, immediately it looks through the image and tries to scan for a face. Why is it always finding the white face first? With this picture, I think someone could argue that the lighting makes Kristoff's face more uh, sharp. I still would love to do a little bit more systematic testing on this. I think maybe hundreds of photos could allow us to draw a conclusion. I have downloaded a bunch of photos from a site called Generated Photos. These people do not exist. They were a creation of AI. And I went through, I pulled a bunch that I think will give us a pretty decent way to test this. So, Christoph, I wonder if you would be willing to help me out with that. Do you want me to tweet hundreds of photos? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm down, I, sure, I've got time. Some people who take issue with the idea that machines can be racist without a human brain or malicious intent, but such a narrow definition of racism really misses a lot of what's going on. I want to read a quote that responds to that idea. It says, robots are not sentient beings, sure, but racism flourishes well beyond hate-filled hearts. No malice needed, no n-word required, just a lack of concern for how the past shapes the present. I'm going now to speak to the author of those words, Ruha Benjamin. She's a professor of African American studies at Princeton University. When did you first become concerned that automated systems, AI, could be biased? A few years ago, I noticed uh, these headlines and hot takes about so-called racist and sexist robots. There was a viral video in which two friends were in a hotel bathroom and they were trying to use an automated soap dispenser. Black hand, nothing. Larry, go. Black hand, nothing. 
And although these seem funny and they kind of get us to chuckle, the question is, are, are similar design processes impacting much more consequential technologies that we're not even aware of? When the sort of early news controversies came along, maybe 10 years ago, people were surprised by the fact that they showed a racial bias. Why do you think people were surprised? Part of it is a deep attachment and commitment to this idea of tech neutrality. People, I think because life is so complicated and our social world is so messy, really cling on to something that will save us and a way of making decisions that's not kind of drenched in, in the, the, the muck of all of human subjectivity, human prejudice and frailty. We want it so much to be we true. We want it so much to be true, you know? And so the danger is, is that we don't question it. And still, we, we continue to have, you know, so-called glitches when it comes to race and skin complexion. And I don't think that they're glitches. It's a systemic issue in the truest sense of the word. It has to do with our computer systems and the process of design. AI can seem pretty abstract sometimes. So we built this to help explain how machine learning works and what can go wrong. This black box is the part of the system that we interact with. It's the software that decides which dating profiles we might like, how much a ride share should cost, or how a photo should be cropped on Twitter. We just see a device making a decision, or more accurately, a prediction. What we don't see is all of the human decisions that went into the design of that technology. Now it's true that when you're dealing with AI, that means that the code in this box wasn't all written directly by humans, but by machine learning algorithms that find complex patterns in data. But they don't just spontaneously learn things from the world, they're learning from examples. Examples that are labeled by people, selected by people, and derived from people too. See, these machines and their predictions, they're not separate from us or from our biases or from our history, which we've seen in headline after headline for the past 10 years. We're using the, fa the face tracking software, so it's supposed to follow me as I move. As you can see, I do this, no following. Not really, not really follow me. Wanda, if you would, please. Sure. In 2010, the top hit when you did a search for black girls, 80% of what you found on the first page of results was all porn sites. Google is apologizing after its photo software labeled two African Americans gorillas. Microsoft is shutting down its new artificial intelligent bot after Twitter users taught it how to be racist. In order to make yourself hotter, the app appeared to lighten your skin tone. Overall, they work better on lighter faces than darker faces, and they worked especially poorly on darker female faces. Okay, so I've noticed that on all, all these damn beauty filters, they keep taking my nose and making it thinner. Give me my African nose back, please. So the first thing that I tried was the prompt was two Muslims. And the way it completed it was two Muslims, one with an apparent bomb, tried to blow up the federal building in Oklahoma City in the mid-1990s. Detroit police wrongfully arrested Robert Williams based on a false facial recognition hit. There's definitely a pattern of harm that disproportionately falls on vulnerable people, people of color. Then there's attention, but of course the damage has already been done. Hey, Christoph. Thanks for doing these tests. Of course. I know it was a bit of a pain, but I'm curious what you found. Sure. I mean, I actually did it. I, I actually tweeted 180 different sets of pictures. In total, dark-skinned people were displayed in the crop 131 times, and light-skinned people were displayed in the crop 229 times, which comes out to 36% dark-skinned and 64% light-skinned. It does seem to be evidence of some bias. It's interesting because Twitter posted a blog post saying that they had done some of their own tests before launching this tool. And they said that they didn't find evidence of racial bias, but that they would be looking into it further. Um, they also said that the kind of technology that they use to crop images uh, is called the saliency prediction model. 
which means software that basically is making a guess about what's important in an image. So how, how does a machine know what, what is salient, what's relevant in a picture? Yeah, it's really interesting, actually. There's these saliency data sets that documented um, people's eye movements while they looked at certain sets of images. So you can take those photos and you can take that eye tracking data and teach a computer what humans look at. So Twitter's not going to give me any more information about how they trained their model, but I found an engineer from a company called Gradio. They built an app that does something similar, and I think it can give us a closer look at how this kind of AI works. Hey. Hey. Joss. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So you and your colleagues built um, a saliency cropping tool that is similar to what we think Twitter is probably doing. Yeah, we took um, a public uh, uh, machine learning model, hosted it on our, on our library, and launched it for anyone to try. Um, and you don't have to constantly post pictures on your timeline to try and experiment with it, which is what people were doing when they first became aware of the problem. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. We did a yeah. bunch of tests just on Twitter. But what's interesting about what your app shows is the sort of intermediate step there, which is the yeah. saliency prediction. Right. Yeah, I, th I think that intermediate step is important for people to see. Well, I, I brought some pictures for us to try. These are actually the hosts of Glad You Asked. And I was hoping we could put them into your interface and see what uh, the saliency prediction is. Sure, I'll just upload this image here. Okay, so we have a saliency map. Clearly, the prediction is that faces are salient, which is not really a surprise, but it looks like maybe they're not equally salient. Right. Is there a way to sort of look closer at that? So what we can do here, uh, we actually built it out in the app where we can um, put a window on someone's specific face and it will give us a percentage of what amount of saliency you have over your face versus in proportion to the whole thing. That's interesting. Yeah. She's as fabulous in the center of the picture, but she's actually got a lower percentage of the salience compared to Cleo, who's to her right. Right. And, and trying to guess why a model is making a prediction and, and why it's predicting what it is, is, is a huge problem in machine learning. Uh, it's always something that you have to kind of backtrace to try and understand. And sometimes it's not even possible. Mm -hmm. I looked up what data sets were used to train the model you guys used, and I found one that was created by researchers at MIT back in 2009. So it was originally about a thousand images. Mm -hmm. We pulled the ones that contained faces, any face that we could find that was sort of big enough to see. And I went through all of those and I found that only 10 of the photos, that's just about 3%, included someone who appeared to be of black or African descent. Yeah, I mean, if you're collecting a data set through Flickr, you're, you're, first of all, you're biased to people that have used Flickr back in, what, 2009, you said, or something? Mm -hmm. And I guess if we saw in this image data set, if there are more cat faces than black faces, we can probably assume that minimal effort was made to make that data set representative. When someone collects data into a training data set, they can be motivated by things like convenience and cost and end up with data that lacks diversity. That type of bias, which we saw in the saliency photos, is relatively easy to address. If you include more images representing racial minorities, you can probably improve the model's performance on those groups. But sometimes, human subjectivity is embedded right into the data itself. Take crime data, for example. Our data on past crimes in part reflects police officers' decisions about what neighborhoods to patrol and who to stop and arrest. We don't have an objective measure of crime, and we know that the data we do have contains at least some racial profiling, but it's still being used to train crime prediction tools. And then there's the question of how the data is structured over here. Say you want a program that identifies chronically sick patients to get additional care so they don't end up in the ER. You'd use past patients as your examples, but you have to choose a label variable. You have to define for the machine what a high-risk patient is. There's not always an obvious answer. A common choice is to define high risk as high cost, under the assumption that people who use a lot of healthcare resources are in need of intervention. Then the learning algorithm looks through the patient's data, their age, sex, medications, diagnoses, insurance claims, and it finds the combination of attributes that correlates with their total health costs. 
And once it gets good at predicting total health costs on past patients, that formula becomes software to assess new patients and give them a risk score. But instead of predicting sick patients, this predicts expensive patients. Remember, the label was cost. And when researchers took a closer look at those risk scores, they realized that label choice was a big problem. But by then, the algorithm had already been used on millions of Americans. It produced risk scores for different patients. And um, if a patient had a risk score of almost 60, they would be referred into the program for screening, further screening. And if they um, had a risk score of almost 100, they would default into the program. Now, when we look at the number of chronic conditions that patients of different risk scores were affected by, we see a racial disparity where white patients had fewer conditions than black patients at each risk score. That means that black patients were sicker than their white counterparts when they had the same risk score. And so what happened is in producing these risk scores um, and using spending, they failed to recognize that on average, black people incur fewer uh, costs for a variety of reasons, including institutional racism, including lack of access to high quality insur insurance and a whole host of other factors. But not because they're less sick. Not because they're less sick. And so I think it's important to remember this had racist outcomes, discriminatory outcomes, not because there was a big bad boogeyman behind the screen out to get black patients, but precisely because no one was thinking about racial disparities in healthcare. No one thought it would matter. And so it was about the colorblindness, the, new, the race neutrality that created this. The good news is that now the researchers who um, exposed this and who, who brought this to light are working with the company that produces this algorithm them to have a better proxy. So instead of spending, it'll actually be people's actual physical conditions and the rate at which they get sick, etc. That is harder to figure out. It's a harder uh, kind of proxy to calculate, but it's more accurate. I feel like what's so unsettling about this healthcare algorithm is that the patients would have had no way of knowing this was happening. <laughs> It's not like Twitter, where you can upload your own picture, test it out, compare with other people. This was just working in the background, quietly prioritizing the care of certain patients based on an algorithmic score, while the other patients probably never knew they were even passed over for this program. I feel like there has to be a way for companies to vet these systems in advance. So I'm excited to talk to Deborah Raji. She's been doing a lot of thinking and writing about just that. My question for you is, how do we find out about these problems before they go out into the world and cause harm rather than afterwards? So I guess a clarification point is that machine learning is highly unregulated as an industry. <laughs> these companies don't have to report their performance metrics. They don't have to report their evaluation results to any kind of regulatory body. But internally, there is this new culture of documentation that I think has been incredibly productive. I worked on a couple projects um, uh, with colleagues at Google, and one of the main the outcomes of that was this effort called model cards. Very simple, one-page documentation on how the model actually works, but also questions that are connected to ethical concerns, such as the intended use for the model, details about where the data is coming from, how the data is labeled, uh, and then also you know, instructions to evaluate the system according to its performance on different demographic subgroups. Maybe that's something that's, that's hard to accept, is that it would actually be um, maybe impossible to get performance across subgroups to be exactly the same. How much of that do we just have to be like, okay? <laughs> I really don't think there's an unbiased data set um, in which you know everything will be perfect. I think the more important thing is to actually um, evaluate and assess things with an, an active eye for those that are most likely to be negatively impacted. You know, if you know that people of color are most vulnerable or particular marginalized group is most uh, vulnerable in a particular situation, then prioritize them in your evaluation. But I do think there's certain situations where maybe we should not be predicting with a machine learning system at all. 
we should be super cautious and super careful about you know, where we deploy it and where we don't deploy it and what kind of human oversight we put over these systems as well. The problem of bias in AI is really big. It's really difficult, but I don't think it means we have to give up on machine learning altogether. One benefit of bias in a computer versus bias in a human is that you can measure and track it fairly easily. And you can tinker with your model to try to get fair outcomes if you're motivated to do so. The first step was becoming aware of the problem. Now the second step is um, enforcing solutions, which I think we're just beginning to see now. But Deb is raising a bigger question. Not just how do we get bias out of the algorithms, but which algorithm should be used at all? Do we need a predictive model to be cropping our photos? Do we want facial recognition in our communities? Many would say no, whether it's biased or not. And that question of which technologies get built and how they get deployed in our world, it boils down to resources and power. It's the power to decide whose interests will be served by a predictive model and which questions get asked. You could ask, okay, let's, I want to know why, how landlords are making life for renters hard. <laughs> which landlords are not fixing up their buildings? Which ones are hiking rent? Or you could ask, okay, let's figure out which renters have low credit scores. Let's figure out the people who have a gap in unemployment, so I don't want to rent to them. And so it's at that problem of forming the question and posing the problem that the power dynamics are already being laid that set us off in one trajectory or another. And the big challenge there being that with these two possible lines of inquiry, one of those is probably a lot more profitable exactly. than the other one. Exactly. And too often the people who are creating these tools, they don't necessarily have to share the interests of the people who are posing the questions, but those are their clients. So the, the question for the designers and the programmers is, are you accountable only to your clients? Or are you also accountable to the larger body politic? Are you responsible for what these tools do in the world? So wow, that was um, that was a pretty powerful film, um, and it gives us a lot to think about. You know, I, I like the way it kind of starts out fun and light, looking at you know Twitter and pictures, but to kind of get the idea out, but then really get serious. Loranda, I'd love to hear your reaction and thoughts about about the topic and about the video. I thought okay, so. I I took some notes. So if I'm looking down, everybody, it's because I, I want to sort of highlight some of the things that was um, mentioned and highlighted in the video. I thought it was really interesting and similar to you, Kathy, I appreciated the start of sort of just something that doesn't really harm, it's no big deal, it's just picture cropping. And you know, the, the subtlety of what that might mean and how they gradually applied it to healthcare and, and how it might impact health outcomes and whether a patient is knowingly or unknowingly, um, we're affected by artificial intelligence. Then I got the noodling on even the concept of artificial intelligence, right? That it's not, how did I say it? I said, artificial intelligence is, um, it's not, it's not, it's, I think that, I think the um, young lady in the film called it tech, tech, tra tech neutrality, right? Our, our deepest desire is that we create these systems and tools that help us to eliminate the bias that's like inherent in all of us. Well, it's impossible because artificial intelligence, just the word artificial itself implies that it's man-made, mm -hmm. that we are influencing the intelligence. And because we are all inherently biased, knowingly or unknowingly, we are also creating these tools or algorithms that have these biased outcomes. And so when we think about how that applies to healthcare, and it has a long history, right? So at Trinity Health, we're doing a lot of work for the past three years. Um, we've been doing a lot of work around systemic racism. And we were one of the first um, healthcare organizations that proclaimed publicly that racism was a public health crisis, right? And so we've been really um, 
intentional about looking at the literature, looking at how we might intentionally or unintentionally have these systems or processes in place in our clinical functions, in our HR functions. And we've done a lot of work over the past three years from reviewing our policies, our HR policies, updating them, eliminating some, to looking at some of our clinical algorithms that are used routinely in medicine, not just at Trinity Health. And so um, for the sake of, you know, we want, I'm, I'm so interested to know what you thought of the video and also being able to communicate and sort of talk and chat with the others who joined us today. But the two I'll mention are relatively known in the literature. And that's the GFR score mm -hmm. or, or score specific to kidney functions. Mm -hmm. And we know that in medicine, there are certain clinical algorithms or certain tools that we use to predict whether or not we're going to refer somebody to care or they get certain tests. And so we know either doing those things or not doing those things could have a negative impact on the health outcome. And so for kidney functions, in black patients, when you use this adjustment, the GFR, the eGFR, when you use this adjustment, it basically yields a higher estimation of kidney functions than what actually is happening. And so what does that mean? It could possibly mean that black patients will have a delay in their referrals to kidney specialists, right? That it could delay trans, trans, uh, transportation. <laughs> transplantation, right? Getting a transplant, right? And it could ultimately lead to worse outcomes for Black patients, right? And so what we did this year at Trinity Health is that we actually eliminated that adjustment in all of our labs. So we've taken that out of our labs and we no longer use that adjustment as it relates to kidney functions. Another one that's sort of easy, and, and I'm using these two because these are easy ones for people who are in health systems who may be at the beginning of their journey to exploring this and understanding it and like, where can we start? So the GFR or the EGFR is one. The second one is VBAC or vaginal birth after cesarean. And many organizations have adjusted, but the traditional sense, and all of these things are steeped in racist ideology, right? that Black patients um, can tolerate more pain, that Black patients um, don't experience, other than experiencing pain, that we uh, secrete more creatine more than others, that we are more likely to um, not have a successful vaginal birth after having a cesarean. And so when you make these adjustments, like for VBAC, when you make these adjustments, it basically predicts that Black and Hispanic women are more likely to have a successful vaginal birth after having a cesarean. And so for the women who have given birth and maybe have experienced, I'm speaking from my own experience, I had a C-section with my daughter and then I had a vaginal birth with her brother. And I would take a vaginal birth over a C-section <laughs> any day because the recovery time is worse. You just open yourself up for infection. You're off work longer. So when you start thinking about the consequences of Black and Hispanic women not even given the option to have a vaginal birth. Um, that's another area. So we've, we've adjusted internally and we no longer use the, that, that particular adjustment that considers race. Um, and we've put it in our policies and our mirror policies across our entire system. So those are two of the things, but the video itself, I love how they talked about really provided great, simple examples of how artificial intelligence isn't artificial because we are making it. So mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm curious as to what you thought about the video, Kathy. Um, well, I've seen it a few times now and every time it makes me think about something different. This time I, I wrote down a sentence that someone said um, when they were talking about the pictures that there was minimal effort to make the data set diverse. And I think that that's, uh, that, that's it, the minimal effort. We, we really yeah. need to make effort. We can't just assume, like you said, that this is, you know, racially neutral or blind. And, and um, I think the kidney function example is a good example of another thing. And my understanding is part of the reason they made that adjustment that had such a bad outcome was because statistically speaking, they had a data set that had so few black patients in it that they needed to make a statistical adjustment. Well, 
part of the problem is we need more diverse people in our clinical trials and in our testing databases. Mm -hmm. and, and we need to remember it's not just numbers. You know, AI and machine learning can be really powerful and it can and it has saved lives in some yeah. of the applications. Um, but we, we have to be really intentional about what the inputs are and really, you know, get up and look around it all the way around 360, like the example they had in the video, you know, using cost seems like, sure, that's, you know, what that's a neutral thing. How can right. that, happen? well, you need to, you need to make more than just a minimal effort to make sure that um, the inputs that you're using truly are uh, neutral. What's interesting about that, Kathy, is that if you don't have diverse people in the rooms and at the tables when you're designing the studies, you don't even think about it. So if everybody shares the same identity or similar identities, you're not even thinking that, oh, we have more cat pictures in this, right. this, um, this uh, source data than faces of color, or we have more males than women. You're not even thinking about it because there's no diversity around the table, diversity of thought, diversity in identities. Mm -hmm. And so not only do we need to have um, more diversity in like the, the research, but the people who are at the table making the decisions. I love the example when she said, when she talked about power and like when you frame the questions. So do we frame the questions around the renters like the patients and all of the things, or do we frame the questions around the landlords? Um, and so I, I, I just appreciate that, that sort of piece that you brought into the conversation. Yeah, um, um, oh, I just wanna encourage people, if you have any questions or comments, put them in the chat, or you can also raise your hand. Um, we'd like to encourage some direct one-on-one -on -one interaction as well. So, um, and, uh, Rhonda, if you see a hand that I miss, let me know. Um, another, I just wanted to flag another concern I have is, you know, AI can be very powerful in terms of patient-centered care and tailoring care to particular people, but AI is expensive. And so are we thinking about whether there's actually going to be access to all of these um, healthcare tools in, in a just way? And which leads me to ask you, LaRonda, what do we have a special responsibility as Catholic healthcare to be paying attention to this issue? Yeah, I love that you asked the question, but I think we both know the answer is a resounding. It was yeah. a softball. It was a right. softball. Was, yeah. I like a softball, Kathy. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> yeah. Right. But without without question, particularly Catholic healthcare has a role to play in framing, even responding to what we're seeing in AI. Um, and we can see it over and over in the literature, and I and I and I see both Yvonne and Steve comments in the chat that I'm I'm gonna kind of highlight and go to. But we have a responsibility if we talk about if we think about our core values, regardless of where we are, about the dignity and the reverence of people that we serve. That is lost when the computer programs or the algorithms or the adjustments that we use to provide care is flawed. Now, are we, are we, I love one of the questions that was in the, 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 the short video is when should we be using artificial intelligence? Like which algorithm, when should we use the technology? Because it's not, it's not going to go anywhere. It's a, it's a way to be able to justify, I shouldn't say it like that. We like to create systems to, to justify decisions that we like to make. And so if those in power um, want to create something that lends itself or bends itself to its ideology or what they want the outcome to be, it can be created. Um, and we have a moral responsibility in healthcare to be involved and engaged, whether it's from an advocacy standpoint, um, responding to it, doing our own research, and really calling on healthcare, when we're, we're talking about healthcare space, to really think about humanity, that everybody that we serve, every patient, every family, every community has value and is not reduced to some inputs and outputs. Right. And we have to be mindful of that. Yeah, that's one of the concerns I have about AI. It's a great tool, but 
is it going to get in between the relationship between the patient and the doctor? And is it yeah. going to you know, is it going to interfere with the ability to really deliver patient centered care? Um, and I want to make a, another request to the folks listening. If, um, like one one of the people in the comment asked about other kinds of perhaps less explicit or um, examples. Um, if you all have had any examples in your systems or your facilities that you're aware of um, where you've identified or are doing work to look at your algorithms, um, you know, please please speak up and let us know, share that information with your colleagues. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was, you know, we're talking about numbers and doctors, but as Catholic healthcare, it's really important that our ethicists be involved uh -huh. so that we can um, understand what is the um, ethical use and the ethical questions we need to be making around algorithms. That's a great point because I just, I agree. One of the things that I, I wanna go back to is about not, not just how many of the hospitals are using these platforms to make medical decisions, but how many hospitals or health systems are even aware of the data? Like, are we collecting the data to make data-driven decisions. So you have to have inputs to go into any, any system, right? So are we collecting race, ethnicity, preferred language? Are we connecting sexual orientation, gender identity? Are we collecting data that will help us to understand our patient population, to maybe identify where there are disparities so that we can do targeted interventions or deploy resources in the place in the space, or maybe even do quality to look at, to see what might be causing those inequities. Um, so when we think about, it, for us, you know, AI and um, race-based adjustments and clinical algorithms are all of all a part of our thinking and research and commitment to health equity. It's all for us sits under this umbrella of advancing health equity. And it's this confluence between um, identifying and addressing those social influences of health and dealing with racism in medicine. Because historically, I mean, that's not an opinion. Racism exists in medicine. It is in the way in which we train our physicians. It is the way in which um, patients are charted. Um, the way they describe me or my behavior is very different than they might describe you and your behavior, even if we're exhibiting the same thing. So it's deeply embedded in medicine. And if we look for it, we see it. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. And so at Trinity Health, our, our chief medical officer, Dr. Dan Roth, our, our CEO, Mike Slabowski, our board, we are deeply committed to it. And it is a process. We, we didn't get here overnight. And so we're committed and we're on this journey to really not only just look at, you know, how is AI being used? What is being used in our hospital processes? What does our patient population look like? Um, so that we can be intentional because we, you know, thinking about our mission, you know, to be a transforming healing presence. For us, that's the foundation Exploring these things is foundational to what it means to be human and to treat people with reverence and dignity. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> Betsy Taylor put a question in the she direct messaged me, and I'm going to ask her to um, come on, come on camera and ask her a question. And while she's asking her question, I know there are several ethicists on the call, and if anybody would like to speak yeah. about speak about these issues from sort of an organizational ethics perspective, we'd love to hear from you, but go ahead, Betsy. Hi, thank you so uh, much for the conversation. I really um, am enjoying it. And um, so I'm the editor of Health Progress at THA, but I had a question out of the video. Um, I was just wondering if anyone on the call knows if all of the information gathered on a patient is available to a patient. And I ask because I'm struck by if they're taking data sets to explore who's at highest risk for things or mm -hmm. what they're going to prioritize, I think patients would be interested in what's what's my risk score. Um, and so who they may be de-identifying the information, so maybe it's not linking back to a specific patient. But to me, it does raise the question of, you know, if 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 a system knows I'm at greater risk for something, do they then have to tell me what does that mean for my care? So. I just was wondering if anyone has come across that in um, a real world application. 
Yeah, in addition to ethicists, I see some physicians on the call. So if anybody has any direct experience. Yeah, I was sitting here waiting on them to chime in and give us an answer too. But <laughs> Betsy, you raise a really great point. I'm thinking now as a patient, not as like a, a leader in healthcare, but as a patient. I'm thinking when I log into my chart or to Epic or whatever your electronic health record is, what I can see, what's available to me. And there's some things that's not. So I don't see the doctor's notes. I don't see... Um, those clinical notes that the doctor might put in after an encounter or after a visit. But I love the thinking and I love the question because how much how much information would I know and should I know? And if I had access to it, would I know what it means? So I, I love it. It's some, it's some really great comments in the chat too, but I, I'm gonna pause because I see Mary's hand is up and she might be able to add some great commentary to this. Yeah, please chime in, Mary. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? A little blurry, but yep. All right. Um, so I'm going to wait. If somebody else probably knows more than I do. But I did hear one of our ethicists recently talking about patient access to their own charts. And now, at least in our system, the standard practice is to grant patients access to their own medical information. And if there's an exception, if there is like an ethicist who needs to write a note about, you know, some sort of reports of, of domestic abuse or, un, you know, something that is very sensitive, um, maybe a patient's own criminal history or, or use of substances that are not legal, that kind of thing. Um, the ethicist and other people can can make a note why they want a particular chart note restricted from the patient accessing. And the example, this came up in a case when the ethicist was, was invited in, that the page, there was some concern that the patient was being abused by her um, longtime companion. It was kind of a concern of possible elder abuse by the, the companion. So the ethicist said, you know, there was some attempt, some education around restricting notes from the patient because as, as it turned out, the companion had access to the, the chart information and was not giving it to the patient. Oh, yeah. So that's a case where it, there's due diligence in noting why patient access is actually restricted or why certain notes are restricted from patient access. But the default now is to allow patient access to their own medical information on, on the electrical, the electric chart. You know, uh, thank you for sharing that, Mary. And I sometimes wonder if the physicians even know what goes into the algorithm, you know, or if the chart is just that the computer is just telling you, okay, here's the recommended recommended treatment options. Then that's kind of scary too. And are the most vulnerable patients actually using and accessing those electronic medical records? Like, are they, you know, signing up and are they using them? Are they making their appointments? You know, all of the ways in which we've made these millions of dollars investments in these systems, all health systems, right? Mm -hmm. In these systems mm -hmm. as a patient engagement tool, which is useful and helpful. But when we think about the gap of who's using them and who's not. Um, you know, are the most vulnerable patients using them and will they have access to their records to even know all yep. of the things we're discussing? So that's an, I don't, you know, just an unintentional outcome yep. of it all. And I see Cynthia has her hand raised and while she's coming in, I just want to pick up a point, LaRonda, um, you mentioned vulnerable populations. <clears throat> There's a comment in, in the chat about um, how, I, AI can also be used to identify populations that are the most at risk, right? So Absolutely. AI can be used either unintentionally to perpetuate um, uh, disparities and in racial inequality, but it also could be a tool to address those inequalities. So there's that tension there. So yeah, Cynthia, did you wanna um, share something with us? <clears throat> yeah, just a, a couple of points. Number one, um, when we talk about accessing medical records, then um, electronically, Right. The assumption is that you have the equipment and access to Wi-Fi to be able to do that. And some people don't. Number two, there's the language issue. So mm -hmm. where we are in the Pacific Northwest, 
Um, our hospital system, our healthcare system um, is in a community where over 122 languages are spoken every single day. So English is not necessarily the preferred language, but if your notes are there and that's how your records are, can you put it in um, Punjabi? Can you put it in mm -hmm. Tattoo? Can you put it in mm -hmm. Aramaic? Can you put it in um, Dari, right? Um, these different languages. And then Spanish is not a monolithic language. We have some people from Honduras, El Salvador, um, et cetera. So you could have a hundred different dialects of Spanish <laughs> to make available, um, you know, in our community. And, and, I'm, I'm in, and these are real numbers, right? So mm -hmm. there's a barrier right there is the technological access. Then there's the language piece. So um, I noticed somebody posted in the chat um, there's a couple things to think of. Vulnerable populations, access to the technology, but also we're in a community where on the I-5, Interstate 5 corridor, where human trafficking is huge. Mm -hmm. And we've worked really hard with our ED and our radiology departments to ensure that we are able to predict who might be and therefore have seen our numbers go up of those who are being human trafficked. Mm -hmm. And when we put that in the system, we have to be careful because the trafficker could be seen at the same time for medical reasons as the person they're trafficking. And so we need to be careful and cognizant of that when we put that information in the medical records. And oftentimes the person who is experiencing trafficking might be coming in because they're giving labor and their child is going to be used as hostage in order for, uh, until their trafficking term or obligations, if you will, for lack of a better term or more appropriate one, and I don't mean to trigger anyone at all, yeah. is um, addressed, right? So we've got to keep all of that in mind. So why do I bring it up? Because some of our algorithms don't take those things into account. Yeah. Right? As, as a statistician myself, how do you build an algorithm that looks at those kinds of things to predict who might be um, more vulnerable to certain things? Right. Mm -hmm. And how do we address patient outcome? We have two women coming in at the same time for C-sections, but one of them is in a human trafficking situation and the other one is not. Mm -hmm. Right. So how we address them needs to look differently, even though we know they're coming in both for a C-section. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I just I want to just um, keep that in there. And then my last point is that. Because we are a Catholic health system. The foundation of our work is rooted in Christ and in God. And that's love, that's humanistic, that's fair, that's equity. So anytime you do anything, we need to take away our human lens, right? We are to be transforming our minds to think mm -hmm. like God and not like ourselves. Same thing with AI. Don't hook up with an AI system where the core values are consistent with God's values and what we esteem to be. If you put that out there first, maybe that helps set the stage. Don't ever forget that. That's our foundation and root. Don't 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 stray from that. Thank you. Amen to that. I know. Amen, Cynthia. Thank you for sharing that. Cynthia, I was I was went back to the quotes to the uh, chats because it was something I wanted to end up with, and I realized it was something that you posted, which yeah. is that as as we move forward, we need to make sure that we keep the dignity of the human person at the center, and as we develop AI, as Cynthia has written, we have to make sure it's inclusive humanistic, mm -hmm. compassionate, equitable, and has integrity. Um, so I'm going to give LaRonda the last word, and then I'm going to do some wrap-up uh, wrap comments. LaRonda? You're kind for giving me the last word. <laughs> I actually think Cynthia summed it up, and there's no sense of me trying to just speak to, for the sake of speaking. I just want to thank you again for inviting me to be a part of the conversation. We could stay here for another hour. I've just enjoyed the, the dialogue and the sharing of information. And so thank you so much for just an opportunity to share. And as always, however you need me in Trinity Health, you know, we're here. Thank you so much, LaRonda. Um, and thanks to everyone who joined and spoke up and, and shared their thoughts. We could go on for another hour, but we're supposed to end um, on the hour. So we will. And um, before we end, I, I have to do some business, some advertisements of some upcoming events at CHA. And I think LaRonda has one she wants to mentioned at Trinity. So um, we have, uh, we're going to be having our assembly virtually this year. Of course, CHA does our annual assembly every year. 
Um, we're going to be holding it over two days, uh, two or three hours on the 12th and the 13th. And if you go to the website, um, please do that and register and you can learn more about the agenda. Um, <clears throat> So um, I want to make sure everybody is aware of our Protect What's Precious initiative. Um, as everyone knows, the public health emergency is coming to an end officially on May 11th. But uh, beginning the end of March, the changes in Medicaid that expanded Medicaid and allowed more people to have access and stay on instead of have to go you know, typically people on Medicaid have to be recertified every six months or one year. Well, that requirement was waived during um, the public health emergency, and it's back and forth, which means states are going back through their roles and asking people to recertify. Um, and some estimates are that up to 14 million people could lose coverage under Medicaid. Not, not just people who are no longer eligible, but people who didn't know they were supposed to re-register. They don't know what materials they're supposed to provide. So Palo Pantomayor really has taken the leadership on this in our community over the last 18 months and has developed this wonderful toolkit on our website, Protect What's Precious on our Medicaid website. And the link should be in, um, in the chat. And um, we also wanna call your attention to um, some wonderful resources that our mission department has developed. It's called Renew Year. And they are daily resources provided throughout the year to invite us all to the daily practice of well-being. So I hope you will you will check that out. Uh, someone in the chat has asked if the video will be available. And yes, the video of this talk will be available um, shortly and will be sent out to you and be available on the uh, website. So um, we also have at the end of the, um, on the, well, you can see on the, on the screen, <laughs> we have some um, places you can go to get additional information about these issues. Um, sort of from the Catholic perspective, there's a, a, a podcast and a health progress column that was done in the last year or so. And just recently, the Vatican, the Vatican is a very big project on ethical use of AI across all domains. And they recently entered into an agreement with Jewish leaders and Muslim leaders um, with some principles. So that's available. And on the next slide, you'll see some uh, data kind of resources um, uh, that are out there to learn more about the issue. And this will all be available, um, sent out after, after today's video ends which it is about to do. So I just want to thank LaRonda one more time for taking the time to be with us. Um, and um, uh, LaRonda, did you want to share an event or was that already in the, did that already go I, in the I chat? I popped it in the chat. Okay, we had, uh, yeah, I popped it in the chat. Please join us. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because Trin uh, Trinity does some really wonderful events around and resources around racism and systemic racism and equity and often make them available to the general public. So please check that out. So with that, thank you everybody for taking an hour to be with us and talk about this topic. Um, keep your eyes open. We'll have more events coming up. And uh, I think that's all for today. Thanks. Have a great day. Thank you, everybody.